Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Seattle uh, Revenue Economic Revenue Forecast Council. Today is August 28th, 2022. I am Teresa Mosqueda, chair of this council, and joined here today with uh, my other four colleagues and the presenters. Uh, folks, would you like to introduce yourself, starting with Senior Deputy Mayor? Hi, my name is Senior Deputy Mayor Anisha Harrell. Good morning. Good morning. Brindell, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Brindell Swift. I'm Chief of Staff to Deborah Juarez, who is serving as our Council President. Excellent. And Director Dingley? Good morning. Julie Dingley, Director of the City Budget Office. Wonderful. Anybody else want to jump off before we hand it to folks in the room? This is Jamie Cornell, Interim City Finance Director. Wonderful. And it's wonderful to have you, Interim Thank Director. You. And we wish um, outgoing director Glenn Lee the best. Um, okay, wonderful. Thanks all. I'm gonna turn it over to folks in the room for introductions as well. And I'm gonna start with Jan and have him introduce himself. Good morning, my name is Jan Doris. I'm a senior economist at the Office of Economy and Finance Forecast. And I am Ben Noble. I'm the director of the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecasts. Um, and I'll give him a chance to speak in a moment. I also want to, I want to myself to introduce uh, Sean Thompson who is the newest and final member of the uh, Economic and Forecast Council office. We just brought him on board in June and he is coming up to speed and uh, we're really appreciative to have him on board. Hello, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Sean Thompson. I'm an economic analyst with the Office of Economic Revenue Forecast. This is my first big presentation, so it's nice to meet you all. Good morning, Dave Hennis, City Budget Office, Manager of the Economics and Revenue. Good morning, Alexandria Zhang, economist on uh, the economics and revenue team at the EO. Wonderful. Well, thank you all very much and um, welcome to everyone. As I mentioned, uh, we are very excited to have with us Acting City Finance Director Jamie Carnell. Again, welcome, Director Carnell, and thank you, Senior Deputy Mayor, and to the Mayor for uh, that appointment. Uh, we do wish Glenn Lee the best, who did work with us in helping to establish uh, this Economic Revenue Forecast Council. I'm excited to be here with our Forecast Council colleagues today, Senior Deputy Mayor, and with us from the Council President's Office, Chief of Staff Brindell Swift, as you uh, heard her introduce herself. As you also heard, we have with us a series of presenters from the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast, um, and we will have presentations from uh, Director Julie Dingley from the Budgets Office, our City Council staff, as well as individual offices. The main purpose of today's meeting is for the Revenue Forecast to receive the updated revenue projections from the Office of the Economic Revenue Forecast, and for us as a council to review these recommended forecasts. These forecasts are a key element to the city's budget process, this is a new process that we've introduced this year, and it will help us define the financial resources that we as a city have available to allocate throughout the budget process. I'm really excited about today's um, opportunity to hear the August revenue forecast. As we know, the executive, the mayor's team, is deep in the throes of uh, finalizing their proposed budget for 2023-2024. And so today's process allows for us in real time, both as the executive and the legislative branch, to hear this information for the first time. And it will allow for us as a collective um, city family to be able to begin in just a few weeks on September 27th to publicly have the di discussion and deliberation with the community members when the City of Seattle Council receives the proposed budget from the mayor's office. Again, Mayor Harrell's proposed budget to the City of Seattle uh, City Council will be transmitted on September 27th. So, so this gives us near two months for us to uh, hear what the economic revenue forecast is for 2023, 2024 and beyond. And um, it allows for us to have a transparent conversation with the community as well about how these updated revenue projections can help inform our um, biennial budget process. Let's go ahead and begin today by formally adopting today's uh, proposed budget. A copy of the agenda has been circulated. Thank you very much to Director Ben Noble for circulating that. Um, and posting it publicly, I believe, um, midweek, late last week. So that is available online at the Economic Revenue Forecast Council website. Colleagues, I move to adopt the agenda for today. Is there a second? Second. Thank you very much, Senior Deputy Mayor. It has been moved and seconded to adopt today's agenda. Today's agenda is before Council. Are there any additional questions, comments, opportunity for members to move agenda items around if you so desire? 
hearing no um, uh, adjustments to our agenda. If there's no objection, today's agenda will be adopted. There's no objection, the agenda is adopted. Okay, colleagues, we're gonna move on into the first item of business in our agenda here, which is approval of the minutes from April 8th, 2022. That's the last time we had the chance to meet. Those meeting minutes have been circulated as well and posted online. I move that the council adopt the uh, minutes and approve the minutes from April 8th, 2022. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Thank you, Senior Deputy Mayor. It has been moved and seconded to approve the minutes from our last meeting. Any additional comments, questions? Hearing none, if there's no objection, the minutes will be approved. No objection, the minutes are approved. Moving right along. All right, item number two. This is the review of the second quarter revenue report from the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast. Uh, I'm really excited again for us to have this um, substantive item on today's agenda for us to have a transparent and public discussion about what the second quarter revenue monitoring reports reveal and um, for us to have an opportunity to really walk through this in detail with the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast. One of the specific purposes of the Seattle City Council identified um, uh, purpose in creating this new uh, revenue forecast was to make sure that we're really enhancing transparency and improving the public's access and quite frankly, the city council as a whole, their access as well to information about the city's revenue. These new quarterly reports are really tangible example of how we are aiming to accomplish the goal of shared information in real time between the executive and the legislative branch and importantly with members of the public as well. With the current report that we are about to review and going forward, our city's leadership, both in the executive branch and the legislative branch, um, are inviting the public at large to have access to this information in a timely and comprehensive way. This is a summary of the city's current revenue receipts, if you will. This information is really important as well because the city's budget is balanced to a forecast of the current year revenues. And thus monitoring those revenues is a critical part of the management and oversight role. And it would not be possible for us to create a balanced budget over the next two years without having an accurate and timely reflection of what the expected revenues will be. So with that introduction, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Director uh, Noble from the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast. Again, this is an independent uh, department, independent agency within the city um, that reports as you're hearing today, both to the executive branch and the legislative branch. We're gonna hear an overall um, report out on the structure of the um, quarterly report and to highlight any specific development in the second quarterly results. And then I also wanna make sure that folks know we have invited Director Julie Dingley, who is within the city's uh, office of city budget um, to be here with us to present as well so that we can round out the information, but the city budget office is separate from the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast, um, though we welcome the city budget and Director Dingley for, to be here uh, to present later on in the agenda as well. So I just wanted to orient us to the two different roles that each of these um, agencies have. And with that, Director Noble, I'll turn it over to you to walk us through the presentation on item number two. Thank you very much, uh, member and uh, council chair, in this case, uh, uh, Ms. Kada. So um, what I'm gonna do here briefly in a second is, is put up a uh, slide deck, and um, again, walk you through um, what we, uh, this second quarter revenue monitoring report. So what uh, the Revenue and uh, Economic Forecast Office is doing now on a quarterly basis is uh, at the end of the quarter, so at the end of March, and then again at the end of June, and then September, and then ultimately at the uh, end of the year, and I'll, I'll talk more about the end of the year in a second, um, we take a uh, look into the accounting system to see how much cash is on, has been received. Um, and we total it up, and as you'll see, we're going to report it by category, so you can really see what's going on. Um, as I'll describe, there's a certain amount of delay in, the, in when people are obligated to pay um, fees and taxes, um, and then a little bit of delay in our processing of them. So um, what, what the snapshot we get um, is uh, of, the, of, of the information that is there, and, it, and I'll describe ways in which it's probably best interpreted and, and understood. And really that's the focus today is will be less on the specific dollar values for what we saw in the second quarter. I'll, I will point out a couple things there. I really want to orient you towards the structure of the report and, and the substance of it. And candidly, I don't want to take too long to do this today because the second presentation, which is the audit revenue forecast, is really um, probably in terms of looking forward, um, a really important piece. And it will actually also include some additional information about um, where we think we sit in terms of current revenues. 
But with that, let me let me put up this um, presentation and uh, walk us through uh, this report. Second, I orient myself. So here we go. Again, second quarter report. Um, uh, again, the goal is to talk about the. The purpose, timing, and format. And again, in terms of purpose, uh, as uh, Councilmember Mosqueda has described, um, where goal is to update on the city's actual cash receipts, um, make that information available to, to you all, uh, but also to the public. So this presentation is uh, up on the city's website. Um, uh, excuse me, the economic and revenue forecast uh, part of the city's website. You can see the link there. Um, again, in terms of timing. Sorry, I was... Director Noble. Um, just a quick suggestion as we're doing this virtually and wanting to make sure that we're broadcasting this out. I want to thank Seattle Channel for their um, publishing of this. Uh, perfect. I was going to suggest if they wanted to drop the extra box so that we could see your face, that's great. And it looks like they've already done that. So thanks so much. You can go ahead and continue. Great. Thank you. Um, again, in terms of timing, as I mentioned, it, 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 following each of the four quarters of the year, we'll produce this report. For the first three quarters, we'll be able to do that about two weeks after the end of the quarter. So uh, this document um, was up online um, uh, in the middle of, of July, following the end of the second quarter in June. The fourth quarter report, though, will take some time, um, and in fact, won't be completed until mid-March. And the reason, that, um, and the technical reference here to the accruals process, um, the way the city works in terms of its finances is we collect, uh, we, we balance the budget to the money that is owed to the city because of activity from January 1 to December 31. Um, but there's again a, a four to potentially eight week um, delay in when payments are made for taxes and fees that are, that are obligated in that calendar year. In some sense, we, we catch up in, in January and February. We wait for all those, those dollars to flow in. Again, that were obligations for activity the previous calendar year, and we add them all up. Um, that process winds down um, at the end of February. Um, and then we're able, we'll able to complete the report um, in early March. Um, in terms of the format, and you'll see in a second, that's really, I really want to highlight that. We'll provide detail about some of the larger revenue streams, and we'll, we'll track those um, and have tracked those individually. Um, and then some of the other ones we've grouped into categories, so it's more, usable, more easy to read and, uh, and to keep track. Um, and then we're comparing the payments that we've received at the end of each quarter to what we generally expect to have at that time. Um, when I say generally, excuse me, generally expect to have, what we've done is, is gone to look back at the last few years to see the, the timing of the flow of, the, of each of these, of these revenue streams. Um, and then and we're looking to see whether we're matching that same, and we've done that in percentage terms. So, you know, at the end of the first quarter, you might think that we'd have 25%. I'll, I'll explain in a minute why not, but, you know, we'll check to see whether or not we're, we're on pace to what we have seen in past years. Um, so, less words, what does that look like? Um, so this next slide is an example of what that looks like. So this is actually taken right from the report. Um, and this is the sort of a high level at the general fund as a whole. Um, the blue shows you um, how much we generally would expect to get, again, based on our most recent forecast, the April forecast. Um, it shows you the share of revenue and then, and then translated to dollar terms that we would expect to see. And those shares, again, are based on the historic pattern of, of payments. One of the reasons that the first quarter is so low is that there are many tax payments, D&O tax is an example, that are, that are paid quarterly. But they're not paid um, at, on March 31st, um, but rather the uh, taxpayers are obligated to pay them by the end of April. So as we add up all the cash that the city has received at the end of March, we're not seeing any of those quarterly obligations. So it's actually a, a very relatively small percentage that we tend to see at the end of the first quarter slightly larger, you can see at the end of the second quarter, um, and, and so on. But you also see that the fourth quarter, um, if you get to the total, but it's also proportionally with the larger share, of, about 40% of the city's revenues um, in the end will be accounted for in that fourth quarter report. What you can see here, that the orange is then the actual receipts, um, and then the math below is just the numbers from the chart, but very explicitly laid out. So um, at the end of the first quarter, we were a little behind the pace that we might have expected. At the end of the second quarter, we were seemingly uh, notably ahead, and I'm going to come back and describe to you why that is. Um, it's less of a wonderful new story about uh, increased revenues and more a timing question, although there are some, um, some, some revenues that have come to the city that we, that we did not anticipate. 
and, and more of that to come both here and then also in the next presentation as well. Um, this next chart is, looks very similar, um, but if you blinked, you might not have been able to tell, but this is focusing on an individual revenue stream. So I, I, I wanted to be clear that we are not just reporting the, the totals, but we're digging into some of the specific and particularly the more important revenue streams. So there are charts comparable to this one for retail sales, for the B&O tax, um, uh, and for several other major revenue streams. So we're giving you that detailed level of information and, applying, and providing some narrative description as to what's going on. So again, here, um, our retail tax receipts were slightly ahead of pace, if you will, in the first quarter, and then further ahead in the second quarter. Um, and these results are part of, certainly feed into our revenue forecasting process, you know, and are part of the information um, that we're collecting. Um, we do then though, report in, at some level of gory tail. So this is one, again, a chart from the table. Um, the individual rows are the either, either individual revenue streams or, or a category of revenue streams. Um, as you can see, it, it's even at this uh, level of, of, um, of grouping things, it's a pretty detailed chart. Um, but if you look across, um, just starting as an example, um, property tax, what we're reporting is at the end of the second quarter, we had over $197 million in property tax payments received to the city. Um, our fourth, we're reminding you, if you will, in the second column what the forecast, the most recent forecast, in this case, it's the April forecast, what their forecast is for the revenue. The percentage is then how much of that total have we received to date? And the answer is 53%. Um, and then the next column is, well, how does that compare to the more recent history? Um, and the answer is that is close, it's 54%. Um, you might well ask, and I will anticipate that you might, why are we only focusing on 2018 and 2019 as a kind of historic comparison point? Um, and there are two dimensions to the answer. One is that the city shifted its accounting system in 2018. So our historic record is really clean from 2018 on. And the reason we don't have 2020 and 2021 is that the payment calendar was very different in these pandemic years. Um, we don't think that, again, we're trying to sort of compare pace with which we're collecting revenues now, um, that those two years don't really tell the story as a point of comparison. So you can again read down this chart. And essentially, you know, if we're on pace, then the percentages in those two columns should be about the same. And you can see, if you're visually working way down, that is the case for most of the revenue streams. Um, the property tax is on pace, sales tax, et cetera. Um, one that you, first one you might get that looks notably different is court fines. The court fines were trailing behind um, the pace. Again, if we were going to achieve the revenue, annual revenue forecast of 18 million, we'd have expected to have closer to half that revenue. And you'll see there's a revision in the forecast that's in partly informed by these results. And that'll be in the next, the next presentation. Um, grants, um, a little bit ahead of pace. And then grants, you know, they're, they can be lumpy and they can come at different times. So that, again, it's a place where the historic pattern isn't necessarily um, as useful. Um, fund balance transfers, the 22 budget is balanced against some very significant fund balance transfers, including um, use of um, resources from the um, uh, payroll expense tax. Those are transferred on an accounting basis late in the year. So that's why they're showing zero with it. We have no concern about getting those revenues. Um, and the, so that's that, there's no issue there. Um, I've highlighted two rows, the service charges and reimbursements, um, and then also this one that we call payroll tax late 2021 payments, because those are, those are different and, and worthy of note. Um, the service charges and reimbursements are well ahead of pace on the face that we've taken almost 80 million. We were only expecting 100 for the year, essentially double at 77%, double what we'd expect. The reason for that is that the mega block sale went through and this city received um, a large chunk of money all at once. Our, our model about kind of the normal pace uh, of revenue receipts doesn't anticipate kind of one-time large payments like that very well. So. It's noted here, and the narrative report explains what I just did. Uh, it explained to you that that's, um, we're ahead of pace, but not really in the sense that that was this large one-time payment. The other one that's, again, worthy of note is this payroll tax, uh, late 2021 payments. So what's happened here is that um, the 2021 payroll expense tax payments were due essentially at the end of January. They were a one-time annual payment due at the close of the year. Um, and we received the um, payments through the end of February, but since, and then we, and then the way the accounting system works, we closed the books. We ran the accrual process and the monies that were um, paid in for 2021, we 
added them to the, all the resources for 21 um, and, and closed those books. But since then, um, multiple taxpayers who have come forward and say, hey, you know, we, we're still just coming to understand how that payroll expense tax works. And we should have, you should have paid you in 21 or certainly by the end of uh, January and in February. And we, we, we didn't, and we are coming clean, if you will, and here is our money. So that was not in our forecast because we didn't have any understanding. Because again, we don't, having not had collected this tax before, we didn't know who was even going to be subject to the tax. So we couldn't tell that there were people who probably should pay who hadn't paid. So we, we couldn't see that coming, if you will. Um, so it wasn't in our forecast. So that, that second column, or, or the third column over, second column of numbers, there was, it says NA for not applicable because we had no reason to expect that there would be payments from 2021. Um, but they have arrived. Um, as, a, as an accounting matter, we can't put them into the 21 in, um, column, if you will, because that's, we violate the accounting rules. Um, per um, uh, council ordinance, um, city ordinance, the 2020 payments for 2021 um, belong to the general fund. Um, and let me ex take it back, explain for just one second. For 2022, for this year, all payments and all obligations for 2022 um, payroll expense tax are being deposited into a separate fund, um, uh, distinct from the general fund. Um, but these 2021 payments, they're coming in and we sort of have to decide, well, well where do they go? Um, and per city ordinance, as I said, Obligations for 2021 um, go to the general fund. So the account, the accounts at the end of each month have been reviewing the payments from the payroll expense tax, uh, identifying those that were for 2021 obligations, and shifting those into the general fund. So that increase of 14 million dollars is a net increase of revenues that we had in no way anticipated. And uh, you'll see this becomes an issue in terms of the overall forecast for 2022. It, it is a good news story in, in a couple of ways. One, it is more money today. Um, it also implies uh, that the payroll tax base, you know, the overall amount of money that, um, that is, has been coming in for the payroll tax is larger than we had um, anticipated with our initial forecast um, and with our revisions uh, previously. So that's a, that's a material change. Um, and you'll see the numbers actually, this was at the end of June, the number is larger again, and you'll see that in the next, the next presentation. So those are, uh, those are the two things I did want to call out in terms of actual results. Um, we, this is a, we've been focused on the general fund. We are also in the same report providing updates on a number of other, um, another number of other revenue streams, uh, ones that have been particular, of particular interest, the, the payroll tax, um, is clearly, uh, one of them. So you can see, um, that figure reported and we were at about 22%. You note that in the last column where we kind of judging percentage, insufficient data, is the sort of the benchmark here because we've never collected this tax on a quarterly basis before. It was due once at the end of 2021, and we have no other information about kind of what pattern to expect. And that's a challenge for us. And, and we'll discuss that more again as we talk about the forecast um, update for this year. You can see the emissions tax, the beverage tax, these are generally coming in um, on pace. The real estate excise tax, which is REIT 1 and REIT 2, um, they're well ahead of forecast here, as you can see, um, and we will revisit that point again in the next presentation where we uh, to preview the overall forecast for 2022 for we will in fact increase and it's in largely because of these of these uh, mid year results. There's then also a separate category here of transportation specific revenues. Um, these are not all the transportation revenues. Uh, these are particular ones of interest um, uh, and ones that we've been tracking. And again, you'll see we're generally on pace. Uh, place where notable exceptions are in commercial parking tax and the parking infractions, and we'll revisit those again as well in the next presentation. But again, I want to emphasize to you that the report covers the, both the general fund and its components, but then also these other key revenue streams of, of, of interest. Let me say one other thing too that I, I forgot to mention, which is that the format of both this table and now I've, I've backed up the previous one, this list of revenue sources, you will see this again when we do the revenue forecast. So we are working to provide a consistent set of, of categories for all of these revenues. Over time, various presentations that had, a, had evolved into slightly different um, categories, and we realized that's not very helpful for you uh, nor the public. So this is becoming a standard approach. Um, you'll see this in this report. You'll see it in the revenue forecast. And it's also the same approach in the six-year financial plan for the general fund um, as well. So that consistency, we think, will help over time.
So again, information for non-general fund sources. And then just to overwhelm you sort of intentionally with this one, there is yet even more detail in the appendix to the report. Um, so you can actually drill in, uh, for instance, you probably can't see this very well, but there are separate rows in this table for each of the, uti each of the utilities that compose the utility tax category. And so you could look in harder to see you know, whether there are individual utility streams that are on or off pace. And I really only wanted to put this up so that you could see in general that the, the level of information that's being provided in the report, you can go to the report itself to kind of to, to, to get a sense of that. So that's what I have for this. Um, really just wanted to give you again an overall sense of the, of the format and then uh, a few comments on those specific um, results to date. Uh, and then happy to take questions uh, before we move on to the forecast itself. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Director Noble. Um, just a few comments before I open it up to uh, other questions and comments. Uh, thanks for highlighting uh, the um, additional revenue coming in for 2021 receipts from the Jumpstart Progressive Payroll Tax. I want to thank the companies, the payors, who have been continuing to reach out to Finance and Administrative Services um, to make sure that they fully understood how to best comply with um, Jumpstart. And I want to thank as well the team at FAS who, um, under the leadership of Glenn Lee um, and the entire team working with payors um, at FAS, they have been working with folks who have questions on a firm by firm basis to help people better understand what their uh, total is that they owe or how they can calculate what they owe under Jumpstart. So really appreciate the proactive work that many of these companies have done to reach out to FAS and say that they were still working on calculations and that FAS has been um, really uh, bending over backwards to make sure that folks uh, have a partner in helping to determine what the payment is. There's um, a lot of interest in making sure everybody feels comfortable with understanding the details, but that everybody is really complying with Jumpstart. So that's been a, a really appreciated. And the second thing I wanted to highlight is what you noted around uh, the past ordinance, the jumpstart payroll tax as passed in statute did um, did intentionally want to use the receipts from 2021 to go into general fund really to help um, with important uh, aspects of recovery as well. So you're correct for 2021, um, we wanted to make sure that there was a recognition that much of these funds were being used to uh, deal with the crisis of COVID, to help small businesses and frontline workers and our economy recover. And that, um, that was intentional. So there's no change in how the original orientation of the vision of what Jumpstart could do um, is going into place. And then, as you noted, we codified into statute that going forward after 2022, that there would be a separate fund to make sure we really had greater transparency and accountability um, for those dollars to do things like this that we're doing today to make it easier to report out on what funds are coming in specific to Jumpstart and that the spend plan that we codified in statute is also being adhered to. So it's, it's a good reminder to folks that this is completely in alignment with the pieces of legislation that have already been passed and a important reminder of the um, balanced approach that we took in these first few years to help respond to COVID, um, to pay back our um, emergency funds or rainy day funds, if you will, and then also to build forward a separate uh, jumpstart account to make sure that the spend plan was adhered to and that there was greater transparency around what was coming in the door. So those are the two pieces I would lift up. Is there any additional comments or questions on agenda item number two, which again is just the quarter two forecast update? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Any additional comments from the Office of Economic Revenue Forecast um, folks? No, I think we're good and, and ready to move on if you are. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for that presentation. And we will go ahead and move on to agenda item number three. For the record, this is the presentation of the August 2022 economic and revenue forecast and recommendation from the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast regarding the revenue forecast for 2022, 2023 and 2024. Um, I would say that this is probably the most exciting, most interesting part of the day. This is a presentation that is going to forecast for us key parts of the city's budgeting process that we are going to use to then create a balanced budget in 2023 and 2024. 
the revenue forecast um, is really what defines what resources we have available to allocate over the next two years. And so the today, the Office of Revenue Forecast will be presenting the revised forecast for this year, 2022, and for the upcoming uh, years that the uh, new budget will be developing uh, in September, October, and November. And that is uh, how we use the projected forecast dollars to create our biennial budget for 2023 and 2024. The revised estimates for 2022 will help confirm whether the budget we approved last fall remains in balance for this year. And the revised forecast for 2023 and 2024 will specifically define the resources to be allocated in the proposed budget coming down from the mayor in September, as I noted, that will be coming to the Seattle City Council on September 27th. So before the council completes its review and approval of the 2023 and 2024 biennial budget, right, we have a three month process to review the proposed budget, make amendments, make sure it's in balance. We are also going to be able to have a last revenue forecast that will help inform our final budget before the council passes that. That will happen in November before the final proposed budget from the council is um, is published. The purpose of today's update will be to adjust the forecast for any significant economic developments that may occur over the next two to three months to help inform the mayor's proposed budget that gets transmitted to council. And as we discussed in our, I believe it was May 4th, because I May the 4th be with you, remember that day. Um, in our May 4th meeting, we talked a lot about how there was uh, much, uh, much in flux. And so we have uh, a, a, a economic um, conditions that are changing and evolving. And um, as the rest of the nation and the globe uh, seek to adjust and make sure that their economic revenue forecasts are matching what they anticipated coming in, we will be in a very similar situation here in Seattle. And we could continue to see um, variability in the um, revenue projections, but we want to make sure that there is an opportunity to transparently and um, publicly talk about how those values are potentially changing. So today is an opportunity for us to build on the presentation that we had over the last few uh, months. Again, April was the revenue forecast. And then on May 4th, uh, both the city budget office and the office of economic and revenue forecast came to the finance and um, Finance and Housing Committee, where we received the presentation from the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast. So today's presentation is slightly different than this council received in the April meeting. Um, after consulting with staff, um, thank you very much to our central staff, Ali Panucci, Tom Mikesell, with Sachel Preek, my chief of staff, with the mayor's um, team and senior deputy mayor, and with Julie Dingley, the director of the economic, excuse me, the city budgets office, as well as the team at the Office of American Rev. Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast, I thought it would be helpful for us to receive a comprehensive overview of the revenue streams in today's presentation. As I noted, these are separate offices, independent Office of Re Economic and Revenue Forecast, who is with us today and who just presented, and then within the executive team, the City Budgets Office, led by Julie Dingley. We had previously had a separate presentation in my May 4th meeting at the Finance and Housing Committee and only had the Office of the Economic and Revenue Forecast at our Forecast Council meeting. Today, we've offered the opportunity to hear from the City Budgets Office as well, and we've invited um, Julie Dingley to be with us so that we will get a separate presentation as we did last time and in April from the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast. And then Julie Dingley from the City Budgets Office will be here to present and address questions um, about their portion of the revenue that is not covered by the streams that the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast is um, required to present to us on. So I want to thank both teams, um, the Independent Office of the Economic and Revenue Forecast Council, excuse me, office, and also to the City Budgets Office for being here with us to provide this single briefing and an overview of all available general fund resources. As we know, this is going to be imperative for the mayor in their deliberations in creating the 2023-2024 budget. With that, Director Noble, I'll turn it over to you first to walk us through your portion, and then I understand that uh, you will be um, including an input and opportunity for the City Budgets Office to be presenting as well. So why don't I turn it over to you, Director Noble? Thank you. Um, 
that's exactly right. And I actually think maybe the best way for me to sort of lay this out is actually to, to share the screen um, with the uh, presentation. And then um, uh, I can, as I review the outline of the presentation, I actually um, uh, can describe the relative roles of each of the offices. And I'm going to can work. Give me one second. You'll see the original. Uh, PowerPoint I just gave you first, but I uh, will switch quickly to the other. So, so again, this is uh, as described uh, August uh, revenue um, update is generally the vernacular that we've used. Um, Lead agencies, the Office of Economic Revenue Forecast, with support from the City Budget Office. Um, I mean, the agenda itself will uh, describe a bunch. Sec, sorry. There we go. So, in terms of the outline. So, the first part, um, uh, the first two parts, you, you will only be hearing from the uh, Economic and Revenue Forecast Office. So, our first thing we want to do is give you an update on, on current conditions in the in the national, in some ways, the world, the national and the regional economy. Essentially, what's happened since we were last chatting uh, back in April. Then we want to uh, update you on the economic forecasts. So, the revenue forecasts rely on economic forecasts. So, forecasts of um, what uh, employment growth will be, what income growth will be, and the like. Um, we take a national forecast as an input. Actually. There are three national forecasts that come as inputs, a baseline, a pessimist, excuse me, a pessimistic, and an optimistic. We then feed those into our regional economic model um, and develop forecasts of regional employment income and the like. Um, so we want to show you what the, the forward-looking economic forecasts look like. And they have changed notably since April as well. Um, as part of that uh, portion of the presentation, we will make a recommendation, we, the Economic and Revenue Forecast Office, regarding which of those scenarios um, to use, we believe you should use, um, and it should serve as the basis for the revenue forecast. Um, we'll then shift to talk about the revenues, um, and we will highlight, um, from, again, from our office's perspective, the, the, the revenue streams that, that are most economically dependent, um, that collectively represent about 70% of the general fund. Um, and then the, the staff from including Dave Venice and, and Al Chang from the budget office review the portions of the revenue forecast that still are within their purview. Their close connection to, to the departments uh, makes them ideal for um, tracking things related to like city revenues and fees and rates, um, including the, the city's utilities and the like. So uh, there, there's a logical division there, and you'll see it in the presentation. Um, we'll then give you, as part of that, an overall summary of the forecast um, for 22, for 23, and 24. Um, and then finally, also look at some non-general fund sources uh, the most significant of those would be the, the payroll expense tax. So with that, I'm going to move on. I'm, I'm going to do a lot of the talking, but um, uh, Jan is a critical component, um, and, and Sean will be soon. Um, but in terms of the uh, economic and revenue forecast, um, and is available both to present um, and to answer questions. So with that, um, let me begin. So again, uh, economic update. What's, what's happened since April? Um, well, since April, overall conditions have deteriorated. Uh, this isn't news to, to any of you. Um, and the banner headline has been inflation. Um, and, and then also um, the, the Federal Reserve response to that inflation. Um, um, and we just had uh, information from about two weeks ago that, that the US gross domestic product has actually shrunk for the first half of the year. Traditionally, that might be labeled a recession Truth is, the definition of recession is somewhat more complicated, but it gives you a sense that the um, economy is in, a, is in a somewhat fragile space at the moment. Um, so we're, we're seeing um, inflation tick up, um, but at the same time, we're also seeing strong employment growth. The, the announcement just last week of over $500,000 added in June um, uh, was a surprise uh, to, to all, if you will. Um, so the Fed is currently responding to that mixed signal with a very strong commitment about controlling inflation in particular. Um, they, they're doing that by increasing the, the federal um, funds rate. Um, uh, and so that's certainly a, an element of the overall um, dynamic here. It's not just inflation, it's actually the, the steps the Fed is taking to fight inflation are, are, are purposely going to have an economic impact. 
Um, again, it's a key question, um, and again, the results we're doing on employment suggest uh, are, are strong. The question is, can we can inflation be brought under control without um, without cooling off or or anyway driving the labor markets into a recessionary type environment and and, and, a, and a loss of jobs? So, um, and we don't know the answer to that. Before we move on, one thing I did want to say, and it'll, it will come back to this, um, is the, the forecasts you're seeing were developed um, from the national forecast that we got in July um, that predated the recent announcements, um, both about GDP shrinking for two quarters in a row and also that the that second uh, three quarter percent rate increase from the Fed. Um, so those, those were not known um, when the forecast uh, that we were using was, was developed. However, and, and it's a really important point, the, the baseline forecast did actually anticipate both those things. Um, they actually, the, the forecast folks at IHS expected a second quarter of GDP deterioration, and they also expected the, that second three-quarter interest rate increase from the Fed. So those things, which are not great news in terms of you know, uh, implications for revenues, were baked into that baseline forecast. So that's going to be an important piece as we go forward, so I wanted to emphasize it now. Um, just, again, I wanted to talk a little bit more about inflation and explain and, and emphasize again how quickly things have moved. So this chart on the right, um, which I've tried to animate with these arrows, shows both the real and the projected path of inflation since um, the forecast was the, the, the forecast that underlies the adopted budget, the, the November forecast, which was from October data. That was um, this is showing the pattern since then. So. Um, my cursor, sorry. So this lower line was was what was projected for inflation uh, back in 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 October. Um, it was it was increasing rapidly, but the expectation was that it would be short lived and, and not too high. So it would peak at just above five percent, and then already be in decline um, at this point. Actually, well in decline. Um, by March, which again was information that fed the April forecast, um, that expectation had shifted notably. So the inflation had already moved past five percent. Um, the expectation was that it would peak again now below 8%, um, but then would fall again quickly um, in part in response to the, to the Fed's actions. The most recent July forecast, uh, which is again on the far right here, um, is acknowledging that inflation is now at a national level uh, surpassed 8% at the time uh, headed towards, towards 9%. Um, but there's still the expectation, and you can see that in all three of these, there's still the expectation that the Fed's actions will move quickly to bring inflation under control, even as high as it's gotten. So that um, by uh, the middle of, of next year, inflation will be back to uh, notably more historic levels of, of closer to, to between two and 3%. Um, and that's a consistent forecast and a consistent expectation. Um, we don't have the um, graph up here, but the, just by way of information, the local economy has, has been the same, actually a little bit worse. Local inflation is actually somewhat ahead of the, of the national figure. Um, and that's true, you know, again, everyone is noting increases in, in food uh, and, and gas and energy prices. But even if you look beyond that, the local inflation rate is, has, has peaked up to 8.8%, uh, 8 .8%, so um, quite high. So it gives you a sense, again, of how quickly inflation has become um, a significant uh, force driving uh, both the national and the local economy. Um, and again, the Fed's response to that is also part of the story because the Fed, in an effort to bring down inflation, is raising interest rates. And again, this shows you similar, the same time periods and the same benchmarks, what, what was forecast for what the Fed was going to be doing um, and, and what's now expected. So, can I move my cursor? There it is. Um, as the pandemic hit, the Fed moved quickly to drop rates. Um, you can see that there, um, essentially, as, as, in a, as part of the stimulus effort right, to make borrowing relatively cheaper so that folks would, would be spending money, to be frank. Um, they expected, again, back in uh, in October, which fed the November forecast, that, that as the economy began to recover from the pandemic, that they would slowly and modestly bring up interest rates, that's that lower line into the future, because the economy would be getting its own momentum um, and wouldn't require that kind of stimulus. By March, which fed the April forecast, Expectation was well, inflation is increasing. The Fed's going to, and the Fed had already moved to increase um, interest rates as well. And now again, you see yet a further forecast of, of increasing interest rates. And that's another point that I want to make: is that the baseline forecast, um, which is what's illustrated here, 
not only anticipated that most recent three quarter percent increase from the Fed, it's anticipating further increases. And, and that is what the Fed is signaling. So that's good um, in terms of you know, the forecast being accurate. Um, but this, these actions themselves are going to cool the economy. Um, that is their goal. Um, so uh, that's, and that's gonna be reflected in our forecast as well, uh, as you will see. So that gives you a sense of what the Fed has been up to. Um, sorry. Just to talk a little bit more about employment, this is a chart that we've shown before. It's now a little bit outdated uh, based on those most recent um, most recent announcements. Um, the the darker lines with, um, here on the left are showing the job losses that occurred in percentage terms from the peak of the pandemic to uh, well from the announcement of the pandemic uh, to its worst point um, uh, national level. That was more than fourteen percent of, of jobs were lost. And then you can see the recovery since then. Um, and actually the nation was outpacing us. We discussed this before, different responses on a public health sense to the pandemic, different mixes of economy. Um, but we've been, we have been catching up. Um, just so I say it, the fader lines show you the pattern of recovery from the Great Recession, We're just providing some context about how job recovery um, looks uh, in, a, in a recession in general. Um, what was shown here um, is that uh, as of June, national employment for that blue line was almost back to the pandemic levels. With the most recent job announcements, they're actually at or slightly above. So again, this graph is slightly out of date because of that significant piece of information that just arrived. The region, which is the red line, we were still a little bit behind, um, but we're well on our way to, again, um, jo a job recovery consistent uh, with an employment level of, of pre-pandemic magnitudes. So. Job growth has been good, um, and again, that's um, that's a good news piece of this. And the goal is, is, from the Fed perspective, is to control inflation without discouraging uh, too much uh, that job market. So uh, there's been good news on that on that job front. Um, but one thing that's true is that, and we discussed this again. Uh, we just want to highlight it. It's not the same. The recovery has been different for um, different sectors, um, and this information. Uh, feeds that um, and gives you some, some additional background about what's going on locally. So the graph on the right is showing a, using cell phones uh, at an aggregate level to track the activity in the downtown area. And the blue lines are, are visitors. Um, and you can tell they're visitors in a cell phone context because they come into downtown and don't spend eight hours you know, during normal work hours and, and leave. So you can really tell who's transient, if you will. And then the red line is folks who are coming in and staying for that time. And what you see in the blue line is that, you know, in, and if you've been downtown um, and been to Pike Place Market or to the waterfront, I think you see this. The, the tourist traffic is certainly not up to, to pre-pandemic levels. That would be, on this chart, that would be up to the 100% level. But uh, there, is a, there has been a, um, a, a good recovery, and there's uh, evidence that's sort of an upward slope. So you'll see in a minute that employment in the, in the, sec, in the hospitality um, uh, and leisure sector is still not up to where it was. But this is a promising sign about where uh, where it may well be headed. Um, the office worker side is, is more of a mixed message here, right? When we're not seeing significant return to office. There is some positive trend there if you look to the right. Um, so there is, you know, there are, our folks are beginning to come back, but 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 as yet not in large numbers. Um, and that affects the amount of activity in downtown, including taxable activity. It also affects things like the B&O tax and potentially the payroll expense tax because where people work um, affect those revenue streams as well. So wanted to give you a sense of where we are on both these fronts in terms of, re of the recovery. Um, this graph is looking at actual job counts um, since, and they're measuring change since the pandemic uh, uh, in, uh, so taking February of 2020 as the baseline. The red is the total, and we highlighted it differently, because it's the total. But what it shows is in total, again, this was as, as of June, we are down about 20,000 jobs in the region. But what you can see again, and we've shown this before, but it's, it's continuing to show this pattern, very different effects in different sectors. So um, down to the right, transportation, trade, information, professional services, we have net job increases since the pandemic in those sectors. Um, and those are significantly compensating for the ongoing and continued job losses in leisure and hospitality, which is still more than 20, more than 20,000, 25,000 jobs still, still down again, relative to the pre-pandemic. And manufacturing as well. So we're still seeing this mixed pattern. Um, uh, and and want to emphasize both that uh, you know, the, the leisure and hospitality are still trail. Again, previous charts suggest 
how big these things are, are, are on the uptick, but also just how dependent um, the health of the local economy has been for the past couple of years on that growth, again, illustrated at the bottom to the right there, in trade, transportation. Trade includes online retail, among other things, um, information, um, and professional services. So they've really been the positive drivers. Um, and, and casting some concern about that is, is this graph. And let me explain what's going on here. So this is focusing, again, on those sectors at the bottom right of the previous chart that have really been the driver of job growth. Um, and this is measured in percentage terms of job growth um, annual job growth over the past um, decade um, for the region. So the region is the blue line, right? So the region as a whole, we've been adding jobs in the sectors at better than between two and a half and five percent on a consistent basis until just recently. Um, so the region has been benefiting, but the city has actually been leading that. So the city number is a component of the blue line, but we wanted to show that we're, we've been a force in, in dragging that number up, if you will. These jobs have been locating within the city, um, in particular, over the last 10 years. And, and we've certainly seen that at South Lake Union in some ways, and the development there speaks to exactly that point. Um, and the data here are from the, the PSRC, the Puget Sound Regional Council, which as part of its work to, to assist in regional planning, um, is actually trying to take regional employment level data and, and disaggregate it down to individual cities and, and smaller regions. So it's a, a chance for us to get a look at the Seattle data it takes a little time to do that disaggregation, so we don't have it as current as we would like. But in any case, the point about the chart is obviously the, the last data point, which indicates that the growth within the city in these sectors um, tailed off in 2021. Um, the previous graph that I showed you of kind of that show, of, of the, well, let me just go to it. Um, this graph, this is for the region as a whole. It's not just the city of Seattle, right? So, um, so it's more consistent with that blue line, if you will. Um, and again, this is still, to the extent that the blue line is above zero, there's still job growth here. This is job growth, right? Not the number of jobs. But what it does indicate is that for the city itself, there, the, there's some evidence, and we're going to watch this trend. This was really just an initial data point that job growth in these sectors is slowing within the city. Um, that does jive with um, anecdotal announcements from some of the major tech employers about. Um, and, and, the, and the dollars they are investing um, expanding facilities, office facilities in particular, um, on the east side of the lake. Um, so the east side of the lake would be captured in the blue line, but, but not in the red line. So preliminary results, um, but something that, um, that we're watching and something, again, along with that any anecdotal information is informing some of our, our estimates as well in terms of the longer term growth in this sector. Um, this is just echoing some of that. This is demand for office space. Um, and what you can see um, uh, is that uh, these are vacancy rates, um, and vacancy rates um, got um, uh, spiked up um, uh, as the pandemic hit, um, and they uh, haven't yet uh, come down a great deal. And in particular, in Seattle, um, we're still seeing high vacancy rates and, and seemingly vacancy rates climbing. Um, for the U.S., um, uh, things are stabilized. That's the blue line. And for the Seattle region, the vacancy rate is, is notably lower. So the, again, it's particularly downtown Seattle office space where folks um, uh, we're seeing less demand. Again, feeds into, the, into this question about what does the job growth for the city specifically look like going forward? Um, and candidly, it is a point of concern, but it's it's early yet in terms of, of reading what those results um, really are. Uh, so that is, um, oh yeah, that's what we have to, in terms of an update for the. Uh, regional, uh, national, and regional economies since April. We're going to shift now to talk about the forecast. So, what do we think of, of, the, of the regional, national economy going forward? Before we do that, I want to check if there are any questions on the on the updates itself. And obviously, we can go back to any particular slide. I'm not seeing anybody jump in with questions, Director Noble. If you want to, great. We will plow ahead and. Uh, okay. So, so again, we're going to shift now um, and talk about the forecast. So we're really looking forward. You know, what's what do we expect to happen going forward? And, and that has changed. Um, again, as, as this title of this slide indicates, um, inflation and the Fed response is cooling that that outlook. Um, and again, I've tried to animate this, if you will, with these arrows. So the very lightest line here. So this is a sorry. Let me back up. This is a forecast of national employment, where we're taking the number of jobs of pre-pandemic as a baseline. Um, so this is counting the number of jobs um, in, in percentage terms. All right, so it's not it's not growth in employment; it's total employment in percentage terms. 
you can see the very steep drop um, in total employment as the pandemic hits, and then there's a recovery. Um, and uh, the very light line is the, the um, October forecast, again, which fed the November numbers. Um, and what you can see is actually, if you look um, in the first part of this year, sorry, I'm on my cursor again, um, the dark line then is the most recent baseline forecast. And these are all compared to the baseline. So what happened in the first part of this year, um, we actually were out, outpacing in terms of, uh, at a national level, in terms of the, the job recovery, the, the April, excuse me, the October forecast. So there was um, more job growth here, so this line is above. There are more jobs at the national level that had been expected um, back, in, uh, uh, back in October. Um, but looking forward, um, what's expected is a slower rate of recovery. Um, in, in principle, because the Fed is taking steps to, to bring down inflation, and in doing that, it's going to be discouraging some level of, of spending. So we're expecting lower um, job growth uh, at the national level going forward. Again, this is the, the baseline scenario. Um, and so actually, a, rel a period of, of relatively stable levels of employment for 2023 and into 2024, and then um, starting again to get more job growth um, late in 24 and into 25. So, um, so that's, and compared to what we were forecasting above, excuse me, in the lines above, which is as recently as, as March, expecting um, not robust rev, uh, job growth, but continued job growth um, uh, throughout. And we're now expecting a, a much more, uh, much more uh, slower period of growth um, for 23 and 24, um, and then starting to uptake more at, at the end of 24 and into 25. Um, so that's, and these numbers, we've picked employment to show you, we could put up some of the other fundamental metrics, you'd see a similar pattern. I think employment is a, is a nice summary measure. Um, so that's, so at the baseline overall, um, a cooler forecast, if you will. Again, both inflation and the, and the Fed's response being key drivers. Um, I do want to point out, as I indicated, we have, we work with three different scenarios from the national forecasters, the baseline, the pessimistic, and the optimistic. Um, this, one of the other things that's happened is that the, the risk of the pessimistic forecast has been increased. Uh, the last bullet here notes that it is now 45%. Um, it was just, it was 35% back in the spring. Um, by the way, the probability of the baseline is 50%. So again, it's, this is the sense that we're kind of teetering in the economy between um, a period of of slow of slow growth versus the risk of an actual um, of a recession and, and employment falling again. Um, the optimistic scenario is only five percent, um, so it's not on the graph because we just didn't want to clutter the, the image, and we don't really think it's worth a lot of attention candidly at this point. Uh, it would be great if it were to happen, but it's not it's not realistically um, a high probability event. So, um, the, but I want to highlight that the pessimistic forecast for uh, the most recent update would indicate um, job losses again. So um, having just recovered, or soon to recover, like now at this point, just recovered employment levels to their pre-pandemic levels, um, if this scenario were to play out, we'd expect job losses again as the economy entered a recession. Um, uh, overall demand would cool, that would include demand ultimately for employment as well. So we'd see um, job reductions again into the middle part of uh, 2024 before job growth would start again. Um, and we begin to uh, move out of the out of the recession. So, um, and we'll show you uh, as we move into the revenue portion of this what that uh, that kind of scenario would imply for our revenues as well. Um, the uh, shift again, just to talk about the regional forecast. The pictures we've shown you the data to the national forecast. The regional forecast echoes them. The dynamics are a little bit different because our economy has a different mix of um, of jobs. So um, and, and sectors. So again, the, with the arrows indicating the direction of the forecast since uh, October and March, um, anticipation now from our model is that employment growth will continue um, in, the, in the baseline, but at a slower pace than we expected, and the, and the job growth will, you know, we expect to get to 2% two, two above where we were in the national economy, excuse me, in the, in the regional economy before the pandemic. Um, uh, in the middle of 24, in, in the past, we, that might have happened as early as the middle of 2023. So there's a, there's a delay here. It's going to be a slower period of, of job recovery um, in the even in the baseline scenario. Um, and again, that's 
the, you know, what we're hearing anecdotally about slowdowns in hiring um, is consistent with, uh, with that kind of a forecast. Do want to emphasize as well um, that if the pessimistic scenario plays out, so we've run the national pessimistic scenario through our, um, through our model, um, and this shows you the difference between the baseline and the, and the current baseline and the current pessimistic, again, looking at jobs. So the baseline, as we indicated, it's the same line as on this one, just so when you prefer, uh, uh, anchor yourself. Um, instead of getting a steady but slow job growth, um, we, um, if, this, if a pessimistic scenario would play out, we would shift into a recessionary mode. Um, we would actually face job declines again um, uh, relative to the pre-pandemic levels. And that would extend for its period of, uh, extended period of time. So we wouldn't begin to see job losses um, could continue well into 24 and then not shift back into growth until the uh, until mid of the second part of 24. Um, and you can't see on the graph, but we wouldn't get back to um, current kind of levels until 2026. Um, so that's, again, if that pessimistic scenario is what were to play out, that's what it would look like. And you can see in April, and it's, and it's a deeper recession scenario than had been anticipated previously. The previous um, pessimistic scenario would have been a 14,000 uh, job loss regionally. This one could be as much as 48,000. So it, it is a more concerning sort of scenario for it to play out. So the next slide is going to talk about our recommendation about which of the scenarios to, to shift to, uh, excuse me, to, to base the forecast on. Um, before I go there, any questions about the, the overall patterns of, of economic growth in these different scenarios that uh, we're anticipating either nationally or, or regionally? I had one question. Um, do these, um, do the job uh, projections take into account those who may voluntarily leave the market or be eligible for uh, pensions or retirement since we have kind of the difference in um, the difference in raw numbers from say uh, baby baby boomers and and uh, younger generations um, they do um, it's essentially the employment data, so regardless of whether it's uh, quits uh, or whether it's separations because of uh, other reasons, um, it's all in and the employment data, both voluntary and involuntary. So this is the total number of jobs that are filled, if you will, in the local economy, filled by somebody. Um, yeah, that's how you describe that. I was just hoping perhaps the numbers were a little more rosy because some of these folks, though there might be fewer jobs, there'd be some people who would be on retirements or pensions and or, um, you know, right now it seems like there's a lot of uh, job availability. And so this is not the best news, but uh, I'll, I see Julie's hand. I was wondering if, um, Director Noble, you could give us a sense of how does how does this potential and the pessimistic scenario on this job loss, how does this compare to prior dips in employment? So either under COVID or the Great Recession, how would that 48K loss of jobs compare? Yeah, you, could, uh, you can see some of that actually on this picture right here. So that the, the, the job losses associated with the peak of the pandemic are that, that dip down to um, uh, past 10 percent to about 11 percent drop in total number of jobs that we experienced as the, as the pandemic hit um what we're showing here is that again relative to that pre-pandemic level the, the bottom of that darker line is short of four percent probably about three and a half on the data right in front of me so it'd be notably less uh less dramatic than the um than the, than the pandemic um uh losses but also note that that potentially for a longer period of time because we, we, we're not going to we wouldn't expect a kind of stimulus that, that brought the economy or you know quickly back from its um its troubled levels so it would be much shallower than what we experienced in the pandemic but potentially um and yeah, you can see potential for somewhat uh, extended period director daly did you have a follow-up question on that or any additional oh um and then so yeah see that in the chart that's very helpful i'm wondering about uh, great recession as well. If it that could also be an unfair question if you don't have that at your fingertips. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
it's not. It wouldn't be as bad as the Great Recession. The Great Recession uh, regional employment dropped by more than 6%. So this would be uh, notably less than that. Thank you, Jan. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to the next slide because it, 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 it advances some of this discussion notably, I think. So, um, so we owe you, and we are now making you a, a, a recommendation. And again, this is um, your the next agenda item is actually for you to, to discuss this and improve it. So I, we'll get to the overall revenue forecast. But I do want to present. It's important for me that we that we present to you and that you understand that we can we reached our recommendation about this before we ran the regional forecast through the revenue models. So we are trying to make a determination from a professional perspective on a professional judgment perspective on which scenario is appropriate without thinking about what the financial implications were, because we don't want that to cloud, but really should be a decision about, you know, what do we understand and what do we think, if you will. So, um, so let me just walk through before I get to the, to the punchline. So again, we've already made this point, but the economy is at a, it's at a delicate balance point, and it's, and it's, in a, it's behaving very strangely um, in the sense that we saw GDP fall for two quarters in a row, and we also saw 500,000 uh, 500, jobs added in a month. So those are those are mixed signals, um, and they likely result from coming out of a, a pandemic um, that has had really important impacts on the economy. One that strikes me as a kind of an overwhelming point is that during the pandemic, people shifted away from spending money on services to purchasing goods. So we couldn't go out to restaurants and we couldn't travel. Those of us who have uh, the resources to do either, and instead we're making purchases of physical products. Um, that led companies to start producing stuff, and there's some evidence that they've overproduced. They built up their inventories. Um, Walmart just recently announced that they have large inventories such that they're going to cut prices on some things to bring them down. Um, at the same time, we're now shifting back towards uh, towards services, which may explain some of the the, the demand for um, for jobs. As people shift back into the, back into those sectors. So it's it's an odd situation we are finding ourselves. Um, that said, the Fed has made it clear that inflation is the number one target. Um, they are going to bring inflation under control. Essentially, I'm not sure they've spoken these words, even if that costs jobs, or in the full knowledge that it, that it will, because, and to their credit or not, but what, what they think is that that's worth a short-term pain to bring down the inflation rate to guarantee a longer-term period of ex expansion. So I mean, they're, it's a trade-off, short-term versus long-term, rather than to paint them uh, uh, unkindly, if you will. Um, I made a point at the very beginning of the presentation that is made in the next bullet, and I just wanted to emphasize again. This baseline forecast already just includes some of the bad news we've seen. So, you know, it's not like a rosy scenario itself in any way. It fully anticipated the second quarter GDP fall. It actually thought it would be a little bit worse, as the slide indicates. Um, it fully anticipated the Fed three quarter, that second three quarter rate increase, um, and it actually anticipated some further increases. Um, as I just mentioned, We've got 500,000 500, jobs added to the economy, um, so demonstrating that continued strength in, the, in the, the labor market. So given that full mix of things, uh, the, this baseline forecast anticipated much of the bad news we have had, but there's actually some good news as well. Um, our recommendation is that we uh, base the forecast um, and the slides that follow um, in terms of finances um, are based on the, that baseline scenario. I think that makes the most sense. Um, we also think that we need to watch this very closely. Um, there'll actually be a revised um, uh, economic forecast from the national firm today, if I recall, yeah. today. Um, so we will check on that. There'll be another one um, in September. The plan um, is currently to use the October update, so not this month's, not September's, but to use the October national forecast update to feed that uh, the November revision. Um, if things start to move quickly, um, uh, particularly in a, in a downward direction. I think we might come back at you and, and talk about um, whether there, it would make sense to revise some numbers earlier so there could be time to process through that. But we're not there yet, so we will, um, but we definitely, we owe you an update by November, the only question about whether it could make sense to provide some information ahead of that. Um, and that's something we will continue to consult with you and, and staff about um, as we go forward. Yeah, there are any additional questions on this component? And Director Noble, um, remind me, 
are you going to also turn it over to Director Dingley to share additional context at some point as well, or is that integrated into the presentation fully? It's integrated. The, 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 next, the next portion of the presentation where we start talking about residents themselves, um, there's a portion of the residents that really remain the responsibility of the budget office, and I think they'll, they'll be well positioned to talk about those and, and the implications of some of those changes. Okay, great. So let's pause again to see if there's any questions on this so far. I just, um, no questions, but I just want to comment that um, the materials were extremely well presented. Uh, ben, thank you. Director Director Noble, thank you and your team. Um, extremely well presented, extremely clear. Um, I know everybody would love to just provide the rosiest of outlooks, but I think that um, you've provided a, it looks like a, a really fair um, uh, and uh, representation um and that um and that the the public can really benefit from what uh what we're seeing and and how that might impact us and so i just want to thank you and your team i know that um it's always better to say like everything looks 100 percent perfect but i think the balance for what you've presented is um is outstanding and and also very clear so i just wanted to say thank you that's much appreciated i Give credit to, to Jan in particular, Sean's comment to be, but Jan is really uh, a workhorse in all of this. Um, and also, um, folks at Budget Office and Central Staff, we've, we've been reaching out along the way to con uh, consult with them, um, provide them some, some updates as we've gone. So, but that's much appreciated. And, and that is the perspective that we take. Again, I described that's why we internally reach or try to reach a recommendation on the scenario to, to base revenues on. Before we look at the revenues, we, we don't want that to, to cloud our hand, to cloud our judgment. That's, we need to give you as, as sort of fair and as even-handed a forecast as we can. And with that, I'm actually going to move on to the numbers, uh, sensitive to time as well. So uh, let's talk. Let's talk money. Let's talk about the revenues. Um, so before we do that, I'll take a minor detour for just a second um, to talk about what inflation does to city revenues. Um, and it's kind of a complicated chart. I won't take long to do this, but I just want to. There's an important point here that I want to make. You might generally think that, well, if the price of everything is going up, and it, which is sort of what inflation says, then all of our revenues will go up too. Um, and the problem is that it's not true. Um, and in particular, um, just following this, this, this graph on the, on the right is a pie chart of the city's general fund revenues um, in terms of broad categories. And, uh, oops, sorry. I get my curve, there we go. Um, the, the yellow and, the, and the, the, dark, the light yellow and the dark yellow these are, in fact, revenue streams that generally do grow with prices. Now, inflation may be cooling the economy generally, and that, that could shrink those things. But in terms of their nominal value overall, you know, if prices go up and we're collecting a percentage sales tax, our revenues go up. And if people are charging, you know, it's essentially a corporate tax on the services and goods they sell. If the services and goods that corporations sell, the price of them is going up, our B&O tax goes up proportionally. Um, private utility taxes, they, they're generally passing on their own expenses, so they have to get rates approved, um, in this case, at the state level often, but generally they're also growing with inflation, at least over time. The rest of the pie, though, is, is, not, is not necessarily the case. And in particular, the blue part of the chart, which is property tax, so that's uh, more than 25%, 26, as it turns out, of our city's general fund revenues come from property tax. And per state law, that can only grow at 1% plus the value of new construction. And new construction has been adding one, one and a half percent, even maybe 2% some years. So we've had our property tax growing in the neighborhood of two to 3% per year. And inflation has been running at two to 3% per year. So that by sort of by coincidence almost, that part of this pie has also been keeping up with inflation, but it's not inherently so. Um, uh, and in fact, now as inflation is spiking up, we're, we're going to suffer from the fact that 25% of our revenues categorically will not keep up with this higher rate of inflation. If the spell for inflation is short-lived, that effect it won't go away because the base doesn't change, but it, but it won't continue to magnify. High inflation persists for a long time, it's become a bigger and bigger issue. What it's worth, this is the, this is the dynamic that plagues the county's budget. Uh, a much larger share of their money comes from property tax. And, and inflation um, eats away at the purchasing power of their revenues. Um, the green stuff I put in, it's purposely colored um, because there are policy choices here, policy choices for the council. So the dark green 
12% of our revenues come from the taxes on city light and SPU. Um, essentially sort of sales tax like things that are that are applied to public utility rates. For good policy reasons, you may try to contain the rate increases that are passed on to uh, to rate payers. Um, and, and you should be making that choice accordingly um, and appropriately. It could have an impact if again, we are taxing that service for the purpose of the general fund. The rate revenues go directly to the utilities. The tax on the service comes to the general fund. And it, it may or may not keep up with inflation depending on what happens with those rates and also with demand. Similarly, the light green is fees and services and other things, other charges. And I, in, an, in an inflationary environment, it may well be a public policy choice to try to keep down the fee increases that we, the city, are passing on to residents, but that will have the effect of constraining our own revenues to grow at, at less than inflation. So there is a systematic, essentially negative impact that high inflationary environments can have on, on the city's general fund revenues. And that's an overall big picture thing we want you to be aware of as, you, as, as we go forward. So um, again, I, I want to get to the actual forecast numbers. I do want to highlight um, how, again, we're recommending the baseline forecast, but, um, and we did that before we looked at these numbers, but do want to give you a sense that that pessimistic forecast, if it were to play out, would be a significant hit to city revenues. And these are the two biggest revenue streams outside of property tax, retail sales and B&O. The dark lines are the pessimistic. The baseline is in the, I don't know what color that is. Um, uh, and what you see is that, that, you know, not surprisingly, the pessimistic would generate less revenue, but that that magnitude grows over time as we, you know, going back to those charts, as, as the overall economy were to slow um, over the next two years. Um, if you add up the numbers, the forecast difference over the three years is $100 million. So a, a notable difference um, and a significant one um, in, between those two forecasts. I want to give you that as, as context um, as well. Um, so this, we're now moving into the numbers, absolute numbers. So this is the general fund revenue update for 2022. We're going to do this in two pieces. There are enough numbers on the page that there's there's too many to give you to 2022 and 2023 and 24 together. So we're going to start with 22 on this page. Again, just the general fund, and we will move um, next to talk about the, the two years of the biennium. The shading here is purposeful. It indicates the revenue streams that are the primary responsibility of the Economic and Revenue Forecast Office. Um, although it's fewer rows, if you add up the dollars, it's, it's most of money, uh, again, uh, well above 70%. Um, and I would add, too, that for some of the other uh, revenue streams, the economic forecast that we prepare, which we give to the Budget Office, feeds their, their, their updates as well. So, And they do really have an appropriate space here because the, the relationship between the departments around things like um, parking meters and court fines, they're really well positioned, in better position than, than we to, to, to query those departments and, and get a sense of what's changing here. So uh, the intent, um, again, let me review the structure of the table and then we're gonna focus a lot on the on the right-hand side, in particular, the, the very last column. So we've included 2021 actuals here just as a, as a point of comparison. So you're gonna get a sense, it lets us compute growth rates as well. As you see at the bottom there, you get a sense of how general fund revenues have been growing. The next column over is the adopted budget. Um, again, it really is, is a reference point, so you can see how things have evolved since you approved the budget. Um, the April forecast, um, so again, this is uh, of the numbers that we showed you uh, back in April, and then the August forecast, uh, which is an update um, on that. Um, and then the last column is really the difference. So what's changing in this forecast, right? What's the good news? What's the bad news? Uh, good news is, is, is in black, <laughs> bad news is in red, um, the, the negative changes. Um, one thing I do want to draw you to this, there was a piece here that we, um, one of the things we're doing this year, again, in consultation, particularly with the budget office and central staff, is, is keeping track of some of the carry forward that you approve. So revenues um, from 2021 that are carried into 2022, um, we could have done a better job in April of really fully accounting for those. Um, so um, in order to do a, a proper August to April comparison, we've added a line um, here that's shown in the purpose of change with the text color, so you can see we those were again changes that have been um, that had happened in April that we didn't fully capture when we were adding up the, the resources. Um, so we want to do a good comparison to August. To do that, we need the totals to be correct. So um, we're adding that to, so that we have true apples to apples. It's it's it, it's really a distraction to the to the bigger point about what's going on. So so let's talk about that. Um, uh, so I'm going to move down this right-hand column and talk about what's changed um, uh, since um, since our, our April forecast. Um, property tax doesn't change much. 
because uh, we know what the assessment rates are. We know that's a very predictable um, uh, predictable revenue stream. So that, that's uh, again, these are uh, thousands of dollars. So, but again, a, a very small change. Um, Key, the economic forecast is a key driver around the change in the retail sales and also in the B&O. Um, on the retail sales, of that increment of, of more than $7.5 million is very much um, related to inflation, um, but not exclusively. There, there is some additional activity. Um, the business and occupation tax, the change and the fact that it's different than sales tax is a little bit unusual and has actually to do with um, uh, the way that the base for b and taxes has been reported. And I'm going to turn it over to Jan to talk a little bit more about what's happened there. Um, that's less, um, that's, that's not all the change in the economic forecast. It's also um, an understanding about 21 versus 22 payments. All right. Um, so a lot of it is really accounting for the actuals for the first uh, six months, um, primarily actually the first quarter for which we have uh, received the revenue. Um, so the previous forecast uh, was slightly above the actuals, and most of the adjustment for 2022 is counting for the actuals. And thus, uh, the, the different direction of the forecast revision for sales tax and b &L. So in addition to the economic forecast, we are using the actual that we receive to inform this updated forecast, and occasionally there is a situation where um, these two forces are driving in the opposite direction different impacts on revenue streams. One of the particular challenges here is that coinciding with the pandemic, that the timing of when certain annual b &O payments were due changed. So they're coming in a little bit later um, and figuring out when they're coming and how much they're going to be, it's, 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 it's a new wrinkle for us. Um, and that's that's part of what's going on there. We we, um, we are over forecasting what that base was. Um, so we've adjusted the base in some sense and then applied the applied the uh, the impact of the, of the revenue forecast. It generally has a smaller impact on B&O taxes than, than, than on retail sales in terms of the increment. So that's again, so that the net ends up then ends up being negative. Um, I can also talk about uh, private utility taxes. Um, so again, those are our purview. That's uh, phone and cable and natural gas. Um, there are small changes um, in each of those. Um, natural gas up. It's a, the increment is a small, uh, small positive change, um, uh, but there's, there's not a whole lot going on there. I would note that the telephone tax I revised downward again it continues to fall off, if you will, the face of the earth. Um, we, we only tax voice activity, and people are just not talking on their phones the way they used to. Um, so the next few revenue streams are purview of the budget office. So I was going to turn this over to Alex and Dave to give you an update on the changes that you see there. Great. Thank you, Ben. Um, so the ones that right are not shaded are uh, Forecasted and monitored, more projected, more I would say, um, by the city's budget office. Uh, and starting at the top, the utility, the public uh, utility taxes, that drop is primarily there's ups and downs in all of the revenues, um, you know, electricity and sewer and solid waste, etc. Um, the big difference there is is related to water. However, is that we had a cooler spring, uh, less water usage overall, and so that that. Forecast was adjusted downward. Um, other city taxes includes a number of, of taxes, but the main driver there is um, that uh, we had included uh, an estimate for the uh, heating oil tax, uh, but that the the, um, uh, the start date for that tax was moved back um, by council to 1-1-2023. and so this represents removal of that heating oil tax, um, as well as an adjustment on the uh, tonnage taxes that are paid uh, to the utilities. Um, um, moving forward, parking meters uh, up. Generally, the story there is that, uh, is that uh, we are moving forward with increasing rates at a gradual pace uh, to reflect uh, just the timing of changes so it's not a, a large change. Um, and so you see a slight increase there. Um, but uh, parking demand is, is as high as pre-pandemic levels, more or less, just a slightly below. But um, it's the rates that are holding that down. And that'll be true when you see the 2023-2024 forecast as well. That's the same story. Court fines is a, is a, a big story. There's a lot of emotion there. Um, underlying all of it is just citation volume. So parking citations are largely at pre-pandemic levels, but all the other citations written by patrol officers, you know, um, non-traffic and, and traffic infringement and so forth, 
Um, those are down considerably. And so that's one of the stories. Um, the other story, as you've all read in the press and are aware, is that we uh, had to void 200,000 tickets and issue refunds. And so that is captured in this as well. Um, uh, and then uh, the largest change, well, it's not the largest, but a large change was that um, it, it became apparent that there's an accounting adjustment being made in the book as a revenue. And um, it's, it turns out that is a non-cash revenue. And so it's something that's necessary for financial reporting, uh, balance sheet reporting, et cetera. But it's, not a, it's a non-cash revenue. So we've removed that as well. And so that leads to that entire, all those changes lead to that entire $5.6 million difference downward revision in court fines. Um, I think grants are, are just the case of, of, we've captured more of the grants as Ben was describing. Um, fund balance transfers, uh, these are uh, still involving the federal monies that are coming through the coronavirus relief funds. And what happened there is that something we assumed was going to be a general fund revenue was moved to um, the uh, Human Services Department into, the, into their fund. And so there's, that's reduction there. Um, licenses, permits, interest income, and other is another catch-all category. Um, uh, and that is primarily uh, a, a reduction in business licenses, um, about 1.4 million of that, about 1.3 million is uh, a reduction in emergency services, which is a change in how much of the e, uh, emergency 911 revenues that is held by the county and then we remits to us uh, how much of that the city is going to draw upon. And there was a change in that of about 1.3 million. Uh, then there's some lesser ones that, that add up in there as well, but uh, that, those are the two main drivers. And then the last item is in some ways uh, the biggest news on this column, um, and it's uh, to revisit something we mentioned previously. So again, late payments from 2021 obligations for the payroll expense tax. Um, in, at the end of June, in that second quarter report, which was the first presentation, we had about $14 million of these late payments that we had received. Um, there were, uh, since then, uh, significantly more has been, uh, has been uh, remitted to the city. So there is now uh, almost $42 million in late payroll tax payments that are revenues for 2022, general fund revenue 2022. Um, I would note that from a general fund perspective, those are one-time revenues because going forward, those the, the, the base, um, and this does indicate a, a potential increase in the base of the payroll expense tax, but that those base revenues go into the new payroll expense tax fund. Um, but it's obviously a very significant increase for 2022. Um, it actually helps uh, make up for what would otherwise be a net loss um, among the other categories. And the bottom line is that with this revenue forecast, there's an additional 24 million expected in terms of general fund resource in, in 2022. So that's the that's the bottom line of this uh, this slide. Um, I'm gonna move on to look at the next slide, which is 22, 23, because I'm, I'm very conscious of time as well. Um, so same basic structure here um, in terms of the, we've, the column on the left, the 22 August forecast, that was the same numbers as on the previous slide, included it here as a, as a reference point. Again, let's just see what the growth rates are. You can see the 20, the middle group of numbers is the 23 forecast, same categories, the April forecast compared to the August, and then similarly on the right for, um, for 24, the April and the August forecast and the difference. Um, uh, the conscious of time, the, the pattern of retail sales, um, in terms of what, what we see here is that you know we're uh, inflation continued has a positive impact on total revenues um, uh, at least into 2023. Then kind of the overall effect of the of a cooling economy sets in. And again, we're still seeing revenues grow between the two years, but the relative level of growth is less than we would had expected in April um, uh, because again the, the overall forecast is for a, a cooler economy. Um, that same effect um, ripples into B and O as well. Again, these are we had with the, the adjustment we made to the base. Um, again, based on what we saw in the first few quarters, of, first two quarters of this year is reflected here again as well. So that, that's why you get that difference between retail sales being positive and B and O being negative. That's in no small part us adjusting the base uh, for 2022. And then again, you'll see it, it continues. Um, it grows um, 
in the August forecast, we're still seeing growth between 23 and 24, and you look at there's growth from 2022, you can see as well. Um, but um, it is the overall total economy in wise that we're expecting lower revenues um, than we had in April um, from that source. Um, uh, utility tax, private utilities, again, uh, similar stories, um, their individual increments um, uh, around uh, some of the revenue streams uh, that are shifting dollars uh, into these years as well. Um, uh, looking at the, the CBO focus ones, and I, 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 can you see relatively modest changes um, uh, for most of these categories? Um, the court fines um, that, that David described is, is, are the largest uh, one that, that continues. Again, those are the same dynamics and playing out for the next two years, Dave's confirming. Um, and that's true of these, of these other, other categories as well. Um, so, I, I don't know if, um, so, but the net effect overall, which you can read at the, uh, at, the, at the bottom line, is a reduction of just over six and a half million dollars in expected general fund revenues for 2023 and just over 11 million dollars for 2024. Um, again, consistent with this generalized cooling of the economy and then some of the specific uh, city revenue streams, particularly court fines, um, uh, uh, falling relative to our uh, April uh, expectations. Questions on those? The next thing would be to shift to non-general fund sources, um, including particularly the PET. So, I'm going to move ahead. Not seeing questions. Again, I. I Anticipation here is that this wouldn't isn't the overall surprise. Uh, you know, the, we see the effect of the of the somewhat more pessimistic, oh, not the above pessimistic forecast, but an overall you know, less robust forecast of the economy rippling into our forecast for 23 and 24. So shift now. Um, I'm not going to go through this slide. This is documents uh, in written form with the narrative we just provided for you. Um, put it here so if somebody opens this um, in the future. They'll they'll get those explanations. Um, just to highlight. Um, the difference between, again, this is still general fund, the difference between the two, the baseline, the pessimistic forecast, if you take all the revenue streams together, the net effect over the biennium would be a reduction of 150 million. But we are again recommending the baseline forecast. This is really just um, to, to provide you some context. So uh, shifting to, to the to selected non-general fund, but, but general government revenue. So these things, you know, the, this is stuff that supports general government activity, not something like the utilities. Um, and again, the same format, we're going to look at 2022 here, um, and then um, the next slide looks at 22 and 23. Um, very, uh, and this, this right-hand column that is the changes that um, is really the, the, the major story here. Um, I actually don't want to talk about, we have a couple more slides on payroll itself, because there's, there's a whole narrative there. There is a small increment in the forecast for the payroll tax, um, uh, and uh, that you'll, you'll see that play out as well in the next couple of years. Minor adjustment in, in admissions tax, minor adjustments in sweet and beverage and short-term rental. Short-term rental side, you know, those uh, tourist activities recovering a little higher, a little faster than expected. Um, the REIT forecast um, up because we got we have good results for the first half of the year. Most recent month was was a little was not as not as as as, as rosy as the previous five. So um, some sorry. Yeah. We're not, we're not just straight lining the first half and, and doubling that to create the forecast. We expect a little, little slower activity in the second half, but still a significant increase in this forecast, and you'll see that that ripples forward as well. The transportation benefit sales tax, this is just a tenth of percent. So it just the pattern here mirrors that of the overall revenue forecast for sales. Um, commercial parking activity um, down a little bit, um, and then parking fractions down a little bit, but not a whole lot there. Um, Next slide is again, same structure, but we're looking at 23 and 24. The columns with the red and the black are showing you the change in the forecast between April and August. So um, here you'll see, again, we talk about payroll tax separately here, a slight decline relative to our previous forecast. We'll talk about that. Everything else, small changes. You see that again, the read forecast, um, we are raising for 22 and then also raising for um, 23 and 24. Um, we do, Overall, we're expecting less rev re revenue in 23 and 24 than we are um, now forecasting for 22. The forecasts are up to an absolute number. It is smaller than it is for 22. You can see that relative to that first column. And that's because interest rates going up and the overall cooling of the real estate market. They don't have confidence that the current REIT numbers will persist. 
Um, uh, Dave, you might want to say a little more about the commercial parking tax forecasts, which are down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll sorry. Down. Say, um, it's essentially mirroring what's uh, happening with the regional economy um, going forward. The outlook um, for the regional economy is uh, slightly downward from April, and so we're seeing commercial parking tax recovering, but just at a slower pace. So um, let me talk about payroll in a few slides. There's a, a significant story here. Again, this is documenting the, the verbal narrative I just provided, so it, it's written down for the record. Payroll expense tax. Um, we've ended up with a forecast, which is not largely different than the one that we had in April, but it's oh a gosh, complete- I have to stop you. Uh, <laughs> Director Noble, pet, we cannot have another acronym. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time I saw that in the presentation. I was like, pet, what is that again? So I think we should either just stick with yep. Jumpstart or Jumpstart, you know, payroll or something like that. Well, but just for the record, um, I, I I object to another. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my bureaucratic nature shines through and I apologize. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, it may appear elsewhere in this presentation. It won't again. Many I'm hearing objection duly noted. Okay, great. Let's go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so we've ended up with comparable forecast, but that's sort of a, that is really a coincidence. We've come about it in a different, we've come around things to the same place in a, in a kind of a different way. So what do we know? And we mentioned some of this before. The vast majority of the revenues are coming from three primary sectors, trade, information, and professional services. So all of our work in terms of forecasting is to look what's going on in those sectors. Um, uh, just to remind you, the, the structure of the tax is summarized in the, um, in the second bullet. Just to remind you that the, the thresholds are going to are indexed to inflation, so they're going to go up. They've gone up for 2022. They will now go up significantly for, for 2023 as well. Um, and the other another thing just to know is that it's it's the measure of the tax is payroll for employees who work in the city, right? Um, and that could mean that you're living in your house, or you're working from your house rather, and working for somebody's located outside the city, um, or your your employer is in the city. But if you were someone who lived in Shoreline and used to work in a downtown office building and now working at home, excuse me, you're not subject to the tax. So this work from home is a, a dynamic in that. So what, what so what do we know about the payments today? Well, it's pretty starting. I, we just showed you that increment of 41 million that is in late 21 payments that have been added um, this year. That means that the total payment for 2021 are about $290 million. Um, Last time we reported you this figure in April, it was 248. So we um, we received, so call it 250, we received about 40 million more. Um, so that's very significant. But, and this is really just driving our forecast, the year to date payments, because we now get quarterly payments. Last year they were annual. We've got two quarters worth of payments, and we're seeing a slowdown relative to the pace that would be needed to make that 290 total. In fact, if you extrapolate the current pace, to be about 260. Um, you'll see our final forecast is above 260 because we have some data from the Employment Securities Department which suggests that the second half um, will be of the year, um, there'll be overall payments will be somewhat higher. We're, so that's that's underlying part of our forecast here. Um, and then looking forward, um, again, we saw some indication about the slowing of, of job growth within the city in these key sectors. And so we the, our forecast for growth of this revenue stream is somewhat more modest for 23 and 24. Um, just to, to, to say a little more, what's going on here? Why, why are these payments slowing down in, in 2022? Why are we now, you'll see, we're gonna project, we are projecting less overall revenue in 2022 than we took in in 2021. And we think this is a big explanation. This is a graph of the value of stock in the major uh, tech firms that are operating in the city. Um, all, um, who, potentially subject to this tax. And what we know is that the folks who are working in these, uh, working for these businesses, a significant share of their compensation is coming in stock grants. They are a certain number, they are, they've been hired under an agreement that a certain number of shares will be distributed to them at certain frequency over the years of their employment. Um, but it's the number of shares. And so the value of the shares is then having a big influence on their taxable compensation. And what you can see is that Really, all these major employees, employers, since the end of last year and the first part of this year, uh, their stock values have been decreasing and decreasing notably. So we think what's going on here, in no small part, is that total expected compensation for the year is is lower. 
Um, again, and firms are making estimated payments at this point um, based on uh, what they expect will be the, the, the payments for the year. So we think this decline in stock value is the explanation for a significant part of the explanation for the, the lower payments that we're seeing in this year. And it is, again, primary reason why we're bringing down the, the relative to 2021 20, receipts. We're going to have the forecast that is, that is lower than that because we think that the total amount paid will be lower and thus the tax the taxable uh, uh, payments will be lower. Um, another dynamic about this um, is this work from home thing. So um, these are using that cell phone data again, so looking at specific neighborhoods in the city, those where these sectors um, have a lot of have their headquarter activities, many of them. And what we're seeing is that folks are not working in the office, right? So that has the potential as well. You know, so folks who are living outside the city, to the extent that they're working for these firms, if they're not in the office, they're, they, their pay may not be subject, may not be part of the measure of the tax, and so it may not be part of that. So that may also explain part of why the, the payments to date are lower than they um, would otherwise um, have been. So all that together, I'm going to back up here, is leading us to a revenue forecast, sorry, we're moving here, for the payroll tax that for 2022, we had previously been forecasting 277 on Ten million this number right here. Um, we're raising the forecast modestly to just under 280 million. That is still less than the 290 that we have taken in for 21. But again, the reason why we that we're picking we set on this lower number is the reduced payments we've seen to date. That is the information we have through the first half of the year. We're actually adding a little bit because we think the second half payments. History suggests that second half payments will be larger, but. Um, the net effect is uh, is a higher forecast in April, but actually less total dollars than we took in in 21. Um, shifting again to 23 and 24 um, forecasts, you can see here they are um, actually slightly lower than the April forecast. Again, this is consistent with the sense that the job growth and, and wage growth in these sectors within the city specifically, not necessarily within the region, but within the city, is probably going to be a little bit slower than uh, and and. Uh, than we had thought uh, when we did the forecast back in April. So uh, on net, between the 22 is, is up 2 million, these are 23 and 24 down a little bit. The net effect over the biennium is relatively small, but we got there in a com from a completely different perspective, just to be clear. It's, we're now looking at real revenues, the complete revenues we think for 21, and the, the, the partial revenues for 22 that aren't, that aren't quite on pace. So that's the nature of the payroll forecast. And that's actually the end of our overall presentation because we've now covered the general fund piece, shown you those changes, and now the, the non-general fund pieces. And the remaining component is for you to concur or not with the conclusion regarding the baseline as being the appropriate, and that's all these numbers, the, the baseline being the appropriate um, forecast basis. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Director Noble. And before we open it up for questions, or comments um, since the city budgets office and uh, under the leadership of Julie Dingley was included in this forecast for the first time. Um, thanks again for the shading of the materials so that we knew what information was coming from CBO versus from the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast. Uh, Director Dingley, is there anything else that you would like to add for context? Or, and feel free to let us know if you wanna go back to certain slides. No, thank you, Chair Mosqueda. It was great to be with you, um, Director Noble, Dave, and Alex. Great presentation, everyone. I thought these materials, again, to echo Senior Deputy Mayor's comments, were incredibly thorough and thoughtful. Um, as, as Director Noble noted, um, this is a challenging time to be in the forecasting game, as we're seeing all of the different indicators go many different directions. And so, just want to remind anyone watching that this is but one side of the ledger. So this is just the, the revenue side. And so we're gonna be hearing more about the expenditure side in the weeks to come um, and the pressures therein. So thank you very much for having me, appreciate it. Great, and I think that that will serve as a good transition then to um, receiving the information and then as a council uh, discussing and possibly voting on the adoption of the revenue forecast, which is agenda item number four. 
So I'm just going to tee this up so that folks have an orientation given this is our um, inaugural year of the Forecast Council. Um, every quarter we receive the presentation and then the council, the Forecast Council, um, it is up to us whether or not we want to accept the recommendation to continue on the path uh, that the Office of Economic Revenue Forecast has suggested. If we agree, for example, as uh, presented today, that um, we should uh, continue with the um, recommendation of the medium forecast, not the optimistic, not the pessimistic forecast, but stay right in the middle um, with the forecast that has been suggested here, then um, we do not have to have a vote today. We're in essence just receiving uh, the information. And uh, we would make sure to make sure that the notes reflected that we are receiving and concurring with the recommendation. Um, if there is a desire to change our forecast and to go with an alternative scenario other than what the Office of Economic Revenue Forecast is suggesting, then we would have a vote. And in order to change that revenue forecast, we would need three votes affirming a change to an alternative path. Um, so just to orient us, that is that is the, the task of the forecast. Obviously, we are made of two individuals from the legislative branch, myself and Council President Morris's office, and two individuals from the executive branch, um, the senior deputy mayor, Deputy Mayor Monisha Harrell, and uh, our current FAS interim director. So um, those that is the voting members of the uh, forecast council here with us today. And colleagues, um, I will open it up for additional questions, additional comments regarding the forecast and recommendation from the forecast office. Um, I'll note, just to sort of set the tone here, that um, given the information that we've received, and uh, again, we are receiving this information in real time with the executive branch, with the legislative branch, and members of the public intentionally modeled after what we see in Olympia when their um, forecast office presents out to members of the public what the revenue looks like. And for us, I think that this is an opportunity for us to receive um, what is sort of a, a mixed bag of information, good news in terms of what we are seeing come in from 2021 from the payments of Jumpstart Progressive Payroll Tax, which Director Noel would just going to keep calling it Jumpstart for an easy acronym there and, and, ditch, and ditch pet, but uh, we all know that it's the same thing. Good news in terms of additional payments coming in to reflect 2021 compliance, obviously a mixed bag for 2022 um, current status and how we use that information to project out for 2023 and 2024. Today, I am prepared to follow the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast recommendations. So I'm not gonna be suggesting to our colleagues uh, a different uh, alternative path for perhaps a pessimistic forecast. I will say though that given the increased likelihood of a pessimistic forecast and as you noted, Director Noble, the delicate balance, that's the word you use, the delicate balance that the Office of Rec Economic and Revenue Forecast used to describe our current economic conditions. I'm very much interested in working with the executive branch and I know that we'll be in close coordination with the Senior Deputy Mayor um, Harold and um, Director Dingley as, as they work on preparing their 2020 three 2024 proposed budgets um, to make sure that we're including some contingencies that account for the potential decrease in revenue that we may see in an updated forecast. Nobody wants to be surprised in November when the revenue forecast comes down before a final budget is transmitted from council back to the executive. And I think having some contingencies in place makes sense. But again, at this point, um, I will open it up for questions um, from my colleagues and I I think want to underscore the delicate balance that Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast Council highlighted, but would suggest um, I, I personally would be following the recommendations today. What say you colleagues, any additional comments or questions? Dead air, dead air, anybody? <laughs> I, I will just say again, um, I think that the the information is extremely well presented and that, um, you know, as you stated, council member, um, the baseline is the right way to go. And just it's good to have this information in mind as we build um, as we build the budget, because uh, it does give us a little bit more. Um, I think having the right mindset is always good and being prepared and having multiple plans in place are valuable. 
Agreed, agreed. Any additional comments? Councilmember Mosqueda, we're in challenging times and I'm I'm with you all the way. Thank you very much, Chief of Staff. Um, and please pass on our appreciation to the council president as well. Anything, interim director, that you'd like to add? I know the video is not working today, but you're welcome to chime in. No, thank you. Um, this is fascinating for me as my first real uh, foray into this. I just want to thank Ben and his team for tracking the ins and outs of this forecast. Uh, it changes every day, and they're doing a great job. And I also want to really uh, thank the um, business license tax group who's tracking the Jumpstart tax for us. Um, it is. They do an amazing job, so I just want to put that out there. I, I am in agreement with you. I really think that the medium forecast uh, is the way to go, um, just because it gives us a little bit of a less risk scenario. And uh, I know that the forecast team will be watching this very closely for us. Thank you very much. And uh, I echo your appreciation for the FAS team as well that's tracking uh, compliance with Jumpstart and working hand in glove with the payors. Uh, Deputy Director Panucci, anything from you? Thank you, Chair Mosqueda, and thanks for the presentation today. I concur with everything that was said and just wanted to highlight the and appreciate the offer from the forecast offer to office to give us um, updates along the way so that we are not um, getting a surprise right as we are putting the balancing package together for the, the council's budget. So just wanted to encourage ongoing coordination um, and discussions with the forecast office along with the executive so we can plan accordingly. So thank you for that. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, Folks on the council, I'm not hearing any objections to the recommendation before us. And thanks again to the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast. I am um, also interested in making sure that uh, we lift this up as a good example of where when we created the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast, we provided deference to the office for the recommendation to the council. And, and in doing so, our goal was to remove any political influence over the forecast. And we recognized that receiving recommendations for, from a staff of independent professional expert was the best way to achieve this. And today, I think we saw um, some tough news that was hard to deliver, and it was delivered, um, I think, uh, appropriately so to both branches so that we could both receive this in real time and in a transparent way um, work together to begin um, addressing how this could affect our future budgets. Uh, as the elected leader leadership of both the legislative and the executive branches, it's really appropriate and I think a, a good example for us uh, in terms of how we are providing um, oversight on, on this um, process, but are also being deferential to the independent analysis from the Office, Office of Revenue Forecast. So in making no motion today, I think we are establishing that the city forecast um, is doing, the city forecast process is doing exactly what we intended to make sure that the council is receiving information in real time from the experts looking at the ever evolving scenario from the revenue streams. And want to again thank the um, team under Director Noble at the Office of Economic and Revenue Forecast. And also today, since we heard from the city budgets office and their information was also integrated into today's presentation, I want to thank Julie Dingley as well from CBO. So again, hearing no objections in front of us and we will have the notes reflect that we are concurring with the recommendation from the Office of Re Revenue Forecast. And that is the formal step that we need to take according to our bylaws to make sure that we are approving the forecast and moving forward. So that as of today, will um, uh, concretize the receipt of the August forecast. Um, I'll also note that I think we have gone about a half an hour over in our last two meetings. So we may want to give ourselves an extra half an hour in the next meeting. This is dense information and greatly appreciated. Um, and since we're all receiving it in real time, along with members of the public when it is posted. Uh, we we do appreciate the detailed walkthrough of the information because we haven't had weeks to sit with the information. That is the opposite of what we had intended, right? We wanted to receive it in real time. So I think giving us additional time during these meetings to make sure the presentations can be as thorough as they are is important. And so that people, if they have questions, they can ask them. So we'll go ahead and ask you, um, everyone on this team, if we can ask, add an additional half an hour to our next presentation. Is there anything else for the good of the order from our colleagues before I turn it back over to Ben to review the next steps in terms of meetings that we can anticipate as a council? 
Okay. Thanks again for your participation. Um, Director Noble, would you like to remind us of the upcoming meetings and um, the time frame on those? And let's let's add an extra half an hour as we as we think about that next meeting. Yeah, no, th thank you for that, Clary. I was I was watching the clock and recognizing that we were headed over, and I was it was was interested in the question of, of whether it made more sense to uh, to add to try to deliver the material more quickly next time, or instead um, extend the meeting. But I, I appreciate the idea of extending the meeting because I do think the the there's, there's a lot of value in um, in what we presented, and uh, it would be hard to just squeeze it in tighter. So I appreciate the, your, your time and, and, the, and the, the forecast council as well, and we will do exactly that. Um, as of now, we are scheduled, uh, the forecast council is scheduled to meet, I was just checking my calendar to confirm the date on November 2nd, um, uh, at, which we would we'll then be providing the, the last update. Um, so at 1230 meeting is scheduled. We will extend uh, it may be that we have to move to start time in order to accommodate um, uh, the additional half hour. Alternatively, we'll extend off the other end. It's currently scheduled to start at 12 30, but we'll work on that, that piece. Um, and again, we will continue to consult with you to determine if there's reason to provide a revenue update uh, in advance of that particular date. But for what it's worth, uh, the ordinance that created the office requires that we deliver a revenue update by that date, but it couldn't happen before. So we're, there's, there's no, no legal question about being able to give you an update sooner if that makes the most sense. So otherwise though, we will um, see you in November and we'll certainly be in, a, in ongoing contact with um, staff at both the budget office um, and at central staff. And we very, very much appreciate those partnerships. Um, also, uh, just to mention the folks at FAS who um, help provide the underlying uh, data, we've been working very closely on the payroll expense tax uh, to start um, we've got some jumpstart tax so that we can better understand what payments are coming in the like. So that partnership across the city. So look forward to seeing you in November. Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, we look forward to seeing you as well. And I think in terms of, you know, when the information is posted, let's continue as you currently have with posting it sort of in real time as the meeting uh, is getting scheduled, I believe, uh, a day or so before, um, or maybe that morning of, I can't quite remember. Um, but I think that the intention was to make sure that then members of the public, executive branch, legislative branch had a full week to sit with it. And then um, as described in our earlier meeting, we then give ourselves a week to digest the information. And then we have a short report back out in the next finance and housing committee meeting so that if other council colleagues or other members of the public have questions, they can always come to that next meeting meeting. Uh, so the next meeting of the Finance and Housing Committee on the legislative branch side in City Council will be on the 17th, August 17th. That was our regularly scheduled meeting. And that meeting will give us a chance to hear um, sort of an analysis as well from central staff that puts into context this revenue forecast with also some of the expenditures that we've seen from things like the American Rescue Plan. Um, we do have a Finance and Housing Committee meeting for those who are interested uh, on August 11th, but that was just a rescheduled meeting from last week um, as I was at Local Progress. Uh, so we look forward to seeing many of the presenters at the uh, August 17th meeting at 9.30 a.m., uh, where we will then have a chance to sit with this information for the next week and a half and perhaps ask a few additional questions, but to share it out more broadly with the council and members of the public as well. Okay, with that, it's 1231. Thanks for your generous time today and we will see you on November 2nd. Take care everyone, the meeting is adjourned.